Yeah, well, good morning, everyone. Hope you all slept as well as I did. <laughs> I uh, mentioned the um, the structure of vortex reconnection in uh, as a result of diffusion processes. This is uh, the sort of thing that you can get. These were two vortices approaching each other and gradually becoming more and more nearly anti-parallel, in fact, and uh, both having Gaussian cross-section. Um, and uh, the outer parts begin to reconnect first in, in this way, so the lines of force, the, the, the vortex lines in this case, come, come along and some of them have already reconnected, but the main part has not yet reconnected. So it's a rather gradual process driven by diffusion, and that's the sort of structure. And when I mention bridging, the bridging, this is obviously the bridge between the two vortices, and it's when, when this is noticed in, um, in simulations, and they're very, very frequently done in direct numerical simulations of turbulence, this, this sort of bridge is, uh, often, often appears, and it's the first indication that reconnection is about to happen, full reconnection reconnection in the sense that these two vortices are going to become two going the other way. Um, well, I'll come back to that and, and maybe elaborate a bit on the problem of vortex reconnection tomorrow because it seems to be very important and very central. But um, for that reason, I thought I would slightly change the order um, that I had announced and to give what was to have been lecture four today as uh, lecture three. Um, and this is, um, is a closely related topic, in fact. And uh, this is the title, it's the soap film dynamics and topological jumps under continuous deformation. So you can see it's in the spirit of what we're doing and linkage turns out to play an important part in this problem. This is work that I've been involved in for quite a number of years with uh, a number of collaborators, particularly Ray Goldstein and Adrian's, his wife, Adriana Pesch, in uh, Cambridge, who uh, have been responsible for the experiments. Um, Ray Goldstein has a very good laboratory, very good equipment, although it's in the mathematics department at uh, Cambridge. And the important thing is a very high-speed camera to resolve what is going on in this sort of problem. Renzo was involved at a, an early stage in this work. I remember uh, in my office playing with Renzo with uh, soap films and observing the sort of jump that I'm going to tell you about. And uh, that uh, is the sort of thing you can play with at the kitchen sink. But in order to do anything serious, you do need the high-speed camera. Um, so uh, let's see what this is all about. Um, uh <coughs> soap films are minimal area surfaces. That's because the um, if you take a soap film bounded by a wire loop, here's an example, a single wire loop, and here's one with three, three loops. And these are both quite famous minimal surfaces, Enneper's surface and this is Costa's minimal surface. Um, it's minimal area. And the area uh, of a soap film is proportional to its energy in terms of um, the surface tension. So um, a minimal area surface is really a minimal energy uh, configuration. And it's minimal energy that we've been concerned about here. Well, I want to draw attention to this figure, which I've taken great care to put on the board for you. It's uh, uh, what we were discussing yesterday. Um, we had an, an initial magnetic field which was allowed to relax in time to an equilibrium field, uh, a magnetostatic equilibrium. And I put a capital E there to indicate equilibrium as time t goes to infinity. This um, occurs in a function space and the function space is really a space in which the energy energy is, is finite. That's the important thing. Of course, you can impose conditions of continuity on the, on the space as well. Um, 
and <laughs> I like to consider smooth, initially smooth magnetic fields, which means that they're continuous and have as many continuous derivatives as the context may require. Um, but this space is foliated uh, in the sense that um, on one folium or one leaf of the space, only you only get fields that are topologically accessible from the initial field by continuous distortion, by isotopy, if you like. That is to say, mappings from a point A in the space to a point X at time T, a function of A and T. With uh, when T is zero, this is just the identity. So we're concerned with isotopy in the fluid dynamical context. And this folium then consists of fields that can be um, attained by some isotopy, by some continuous velocity distribution which distorts the field. And um, the path that uh, is chosen here depends on the dynamical model that you uh, that you adopt. And if it's Navier-Stokes, the natural Navier-Stokes model, then you get uh, an evolution towards an equilibrium. And um, that equilibrium is a minimum. So you can draw um, energy is decreasing as you go along this path. The ener magnetic energy is decreasing. And when you get to this point, it's a minimum. So conceptually, we can draw curves around that, curves of constant energy. And the energy is a minimum here, and we've gone downhill to the final equilibrium state. And there may, as I say, be other minima in this space, and different dynamical models will take, or different initial conditions, will take you to different minima. So it's not unique. But you're constrained to lie on that particular folium. I think this sort of picture was the first, uh, again, produced by Arnold can be found in one of his papers. Um, so that's the sort of picture that we were concerned with yesterday. And similar things apply in this uh, uh, soap film context here. Um, um. Uh, the motivation um, comes from analogy again. Uh, I've talked a little bit about magnetic field topology, but this is uh, uh, in solar flare activity. Here you have uh, the surface of the sun, the photosphere, and magnetic field lines emanating from the surface due to turbulent uh, activity below the surface. And these field lines have foot points. Talk about the foot points where the field lines meet the photosphere, and these foot points are constantly moving around. And the field up here has to respond to the motion of the foot points. And this is what makes an extremely interesting topological problem up here. Of course, you can get induced braiding by constant rotation of a pair of foot points down here. Induces a braiding up here. But there's always a tendency for the field up here to relax to a minimum energy state with the formation of discontinuities. And discontinuities in this context are current sheets where there's large, rapid dissipation of energy and, uh, and um, very strong heating of the solar corona. So that's more or less what is said here. Uh, response to motion of the foot points in the photosphere, magnetic energy minimized, subject to the con topological constraint of frozen in field up here. Um, and uh, in fact, it remains approximately force free. Tangential field discontinuities form, field right lines reconnect with change of topology. Strong dual heating in these regions underlies observed solar flare activity. So there's another area uh, in which. Um, yes. 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 Uh, it can't break if, as long as you're in the frozen field uh, limit of perfect conductivity assumption up here. But then, when the, these discontinuities appear, then then the topology is broken, and you get reconnections. Yes. 
So it's a, it's a beautiful context for the application of the sort of ideas that are, uh, are emerging in this, in this um, course. Um, the, the analogy is, uh, if we think of uh, the coronal magnetic field and the uh, analogous problem, the soap film with wire boundary, well, movement of the foot points, the analog has got to be distortion of the wire, slow distortion of the wire boundary. Slow movement of the foot points, like on the boundary, slow deformation of the boundary that's uh, supporting the soap film. Um, Minimum magnetic energy, well, uh, corresponds to minimum surface area. And uh, there's a huge literature on minimal area surfaces uh, going back uh, at least a century. The zero Lorentz force uh, that applies in the, um, in the crumb, uh, in, well, in, in the solar corona, uh, the analog here will be zero mean curvature because that is a characteristic of a uh, a minimal area surface has zero mean curvature. Um, the dissipative current sheets, well, I put question marks here. We have to determine what what is going on. What is the dissipative mechanism uh, that uh, leads you to minimum area as you, uh, or maintains minimum area as you continue to deform the boundary? So we'd like to understand the singularities that can allow change of topology of soap films. There's, uh, let's say, a huge uh, literature, mathematical literature on uh, on minimal area surfaces, um, going back to the proof of Douglas in the 1930s, got him a Fields Medal, proving that uh, for any any boundary at all, you can have uh, and uh, prescribed uh, genus. Uh, there exists a minimal area surface, um, the existence proof. But there's very relatively little in the mathematical literature concerned with the dynamics, if you are, as I say, moving the boundary. And particularly if there are jumps from one topology to another, there's very little in the mathematical literature on this problem. So we felt we were kind of leading the way from from the experimental side, but raising problems that are of great interest for mathematicians. Now, um, oops, sorry. There is um, there is a, a great history um, for uh, minimal area surfaces, and uh, as in so many things, this goes back to Euler in 1744. He wrote a paper on the catenoid, the minimal area surface, um, bounded by two circles with a concentric uh, axis, with a ax common axis. And uh, this is the picture of the minimal surface. B, uh, 2B is the separation of the two circles. So we've got two circular wires here, think of it, and uh, a soap film connecting. And as everyone knows, I think this uh, surface is a catenoid surface of revolution of a catenary. Um, and um, when the separation 2b, b, b uh, relative to the radius a, is 0 0.1, then it's, uh, it's almost cylindrical. Um, it begins to curve inwards as you increase the separation. And there's a fairly uh, marked inward curvature here. but it's such that always the the mean curvature at any point of this surface is zero. You've got curvature both ways, round, round the axis, and in this sense here, and it's the mean that is equal to zero at every point. And that defines the catenoid. Now it appears that uh, there is a critical value, and it's point six six two seven approximately beyond which this um, minimal area catenoid just does not exist. And the reason for that is the following, that um, at any, um, let's see, at any value of B less than uh, this critical value, I've taken it here equal to 0 0.6, um, there's a whole family of catenoids um, bounded by the two circles. And the area of 
the if you as as you run through the if it's a one parameter family as you run through the parameter the area uh, has a maximum and it has a minimum and the catenary or the catenoid that is realized by soap film uh, corresponds to this minimum area so it's a particular value a particular catenary within the one parameter family that is realized now as you increase b the um, maximum and the minimum move into coincidence and eventually well at, at an inflection point and eventually uh, beyond this critical value here it's b equals 0 0.7 there's no minimum no maximum so if you start anywhere on this uh, curve you run downhill uh, and that is actually corresponds to collapse of the catenoid to a singularity on the axis this is the the way they used to publish things in those far off days I'm afraid the style of publication has gone downhill ever since <laughs> wouldn't it be nice to have a paper with this sort of title page <laughs> um, okay well um, there is an actual photograph of uh, our catenoid soap film near to criticality if we pull the wires a little further apart that will collapse um, and um, actually w you can do it uh, two ways you can pull them apart or you can change the angle slightly between the two wires here we changed the angle and um, let's see if this uh, uh, I think I've got to do it over here oh good it's going there we go look at that that's what happens I will try it again because I wasn't watching um, <laughs> whoops go back one there we go see it is collapsing we've moved just beyond collapses to singularity and then that's fluid mechanics where the a thread singularity forms but that is unstable and it breaks and uh, forms a drop and and, and and a few satellite drops as you see and uh, the drops um, bounce on the the two films that uh, survive um, the two discs which together have a smaller area than the original catenoid so we've moved to a lower energy uh, a lower energy situation with a lot of dissipation of energy as you see uh, going going on so under a slight rotation of the upper wire the catenoid collapses and splits at an interior singularity an interior um, not on the boundary in other words um, a, a process driven by surface tension and resolved by actually by film inertia and these are the papers that have uh, discuss this um, this particular problem in in some detail there's a, a wonderful sequence of uh, papers by Yves Couder concerning bouncing droplets where you have a a, a, a film and uh, you can actually maintain a by vibrating the the uh, the film up and down you can have a droplet that bounces more or less um, indefinitely but that's a different story I say there's enough uh, in just this experiment to for about five PhD theses. Um, <coughs> you can also consider soap films that have a connecting film at the center here, and uh, then you have a triple connection here. So there's a there's a disc film in there as well, and uh, in equilibrium the angle, the three angles have to be um, 120 degrees for equilibrium and here the rings are actually at maximum separation for the existence of a minimum area solution the problem is just a little bit different but uh, you have to build in this constraint of the 120 degree angle but you can solve quite uh, easily for the critical separation for the existence of a minimum area solution now the second motivation for studying this um, problem and again it comes from dynamo theory and a famous paper by Weinstein and Zeldovich in 1972 here is uh, Zeldovich who was very famous in 
cosmology and um, other fields of theoretical physics, um, a, a great, uh, a great physicist, a theoretical physicist. Um, and uh, there was a paper in which the concept of the stretch-twist-fold mechanism for what was called fast dynamo action was introduced, a mechanism for the intensification of a magnetic field that appears to operate without any need to invoke diffusive effects. A magnetic field is doubled in intensity and its energy increased fourfold with each iteration of this cycle. Well, it's a very simple cycle. It's like taking an circular elastic band, you stretch it to double the radius, you f twist it and fold it back on itself to get nearly the double cover of a circle. And in that process, if the double cover of the new, cir new circle is the same radius as the old one, you have increased the energy fourfold. And then you repeat, stretch, twist, fold, again and again, and get effectively an exponential increase of magnetic energy. And there's no doubt that does. But there's a slight change in the structure of the field at every stage of this process. So it's not actually a dynamo in the conventional sense that requires the growth of a magnetic field without change of structure. And that uh, restoring the original structure we know now does require diffusion. Um, however, this is an important area itself, um, fast dynamo action, and uh, a whole book has been written about it by Childress and Andrew Gilbert, who was one of my students back in the 1980s. Um, and uh, it's uh, still a very active area of, of research. Um, here's another of my former students, Conrad Beyer, also from that period, the 1980s, and uh, who very sadly died just uh, three years ago. Um, but he was very much involved with me in this sort of research until, until this time, over quite a long period. But um, we devised um, a particular flow, a velocity field in a fl inside a sphere that um, somehow contains these three ingredients, stretching, twisting, and folding, all contained within a sphere. And um, this was the resulting velocity field, its components in Cartesian coordinates, you see minus 8xy, and then another quadratic function of x, y, and z here, and uh, similarly here. So this is all quadratic in the Cartesian coordinates, plus alpha, so there's this one free parameter, times um, what is actually a rotation, a rigid body rotation about the y axis. And um, it turns out that when alpha is uh, zero, this is an integrable system. When alpha is non-zero, it is non-integrable and in fact has chaotic uh, streamlines within the sphere. I think uh, you were asking <laughs> about the existence of such flows. And here's a, a good example. Um, the, this is a Poincaré section, which means you take a diametral plane um, cutting through the, through the center of the sphere and you follow a streamline, and each time it crosses, the streamline crosses the plane, you place a dot at the point of crossing. So this is how you construct a Poincaré section. And these involve 40,000 40, such crossings of the diametral plane, and there's no sign that this, um, that this streamline is ever going to close on itself. And as the parameter alpha increases, the degree of chaos, you might say, inside the sphere increases. There are always little regions, uh, little islands of regularity which survive. And again, there's a huge amount of study in the, in the dynamical systems um, community of um, flows of this kind and the characteristics of this sort of, um, this sort of chaos. But what is rather interesting about this is that um, this being quadratic, uh, the, uh, if I take the Laplacian view, it will be a, cons a constant. You differentiate twice. So you get a constant. So it's a flow that can be supported against a constant pressure gradient in the Stokes limit. That is the, um, the very slow creeping flow 
limit fluid dynamics. Um, so in that sense, it, uh, it has, it's a dynamically realizable flow. It satisfies, uh, as it must, divergence of this is zero, and also the normal component is zero on the surface x equals one, which that is the radius of the sphere. And uh, as I say, del squared u is equal to a constant. So it's a one-parameter family of Stokes flows, exhibiting an increasing degree of chaos as alpha increases. Um, the normal component of u is zero on the boundary, but the tangential component is not zero. So it's a flow that is driven by uh, tangential motion on the boundary. Like you might have, for example, if you had a, a droplet of one fluid rising through another fluid, then you have uh, stresses on the surface that cause, that drive emotion inside. And experiments have been carried out in such systems. You need, uh, you need to have the droplet rising in a flow that, in, a, in an imposed flow to, to get an interesting uh, distribution of tangential velocity on the surface. Um, well, um, that was the sort of flow. Now this is going back to something a little bit simpler now, stretch, twist, fold. They say this uh, means you start with a, um, a wire loop. Um, and uh, I'm thinking here of the, well, imagine it first stretched, but then, um, and then folded or twisted and folded back on itself. And uh, this is a process by which the rife ca changes continuously from zero here to one in the limit here when it's flattened down onto the plane. So rife is one, zero here, uh, one here. And therefore the twist, well, if the twist is um, zero here, then twist must be minus one here because rife plus twist is conserved. So you can go that way or we can go backwards unfold, start here and unfold it, untwist it, and then think of it, relax back to the circular state. Well, uh, it was uh, Renzo and his uh, student, Maggioni, who devised a nice parametric representation of this process that takes you from a single cover of a circle to a double cover. I think here we've gone um, backwards from the double cover to the single cover. When t is equal to zero, zero, you have cos 2s, sin 2s, zero. So you have a double cover of a circle, s going from zero to 2 pi. And when t is equal to one, you have just cos s, sin s, minus sin s, no, minus cos s, minus sin s, and again zero here. So you have the single cover. And you're going through the range. Now s is a parameter from 0 to 2 pi going round this closed curve. So this is a nice parametric representation of a twisting worm. And um, then it's natural to ask, well, what about the surface spanning such a wire? If we take a surface spanning the wire, well, at this stage, the surface that spans it is, um, if we span it this way, round, it's a Mobius strip. And uh, the question is, what happens to that Mobius strip as you deform continuously? You can maybe imagine it here, but here it gets a little bit difficult. And here it's even more difficult. What's happened to the Mobius strip by the time the wire takes this shape and gets back to a circle? So what has happened? And that was the question, a very natural question that uh, one wanted to put. So here again is the parametric representation is just normalized by uh, factor L of t chosen so that the wire length is, uh, is constant throughout this process. Well, uh, mathematically, that's something that's going to be quite difficult to follow that minimal area surface. But let's do it experimentally. So we dip the wire at time t equals, say, 0 0.1, so when it's in this shape. In, uh, into a soap solution to make a one-sided Mobius strip, soap film, and unfold it. And uh, look at what happens. And there's a good precedent because it turns out that uh, Richard Courant um, 
did this experiment. Here's a picture of him with uh, one of his students back in 1941 or 1940, uh, playing with soap film in his office, <laughs> uh, a trefoil knot. But in the article that he wrote, a very informal article, and he gives all sorts of interesting uh, information about these soap film experiments, uh, he mentions that a one-sided soap film in the form of a Mobius strip is easily formed, that is true, and that it can jump to a two-sided film if the wire boundary is suitably distorted. So we have there the possibility of an interesting topological jump from a one-sided surface to a two-sided surface. And you have to ask, well, how does that happen? How, what exactly is going on? So we decided to repeat the experiment. So um, we return to this uh, Mobius uh, soap film, and uh, here is uh, Mobius soap film, and uh, we might look first at the real-time collapse of this film. Um, you see, it's rather rapid. It's uh, hard for the eye to see what is uh, going on there. Um, <coughs> that's in just real time. So we start, we've moved the film a little. It looks, though, you can at least see, I think there's the, the hole through the Mobius strip, disappears, it collapses, and uh, it collapses on the boundary, not in the interior of the film, but on the boundary. It's a boundary singularity. So that helps us to at least make a beginning on, on, on uh, understanding the problem. Well, um, we'll come back to that, the experiment, but we get uh, a clue from the family of ruled surfaces. These are not minimal area surfaces, but, um, but at least we can, uh, we can construct them uh, in parametric form. Um, and uh, I think I had the formula for these ruled surfaces here, but it seems to have disappeared for some reason from the... Uh, but you can easily see how you do it. You take the, the Maggioni and Rica parametrization for the boundary, and you simply place a straight line from a point S on the boundary to a point S plus pi on the boundary and uh, put a parameter on that line, call it mu, going from minus one to plus one, and you get a parametric representation in terms of two parameters, S going round the curve and mu going across from one point to opposite point, you get parametric representation of the surface. And the center line mu equals zero is in fact a circle of radius 1 minus t in the plane z equals 0. Um, well, as you then open out the wire, again going t from uh, s small value up towards large value, the hole does get smaller and smaller, and indeed it disappears for the ruled surface at a critical time. The topology changes, the hole disappears somewhere between 0.6 and 0.8, actually exactly at uh, the value t equals two-thirds, critical value when the hole disappears. From that point on, the surface, the ruled surface, is self-intersecting and has a sort of singularity that uh, moves from the boundary, at time t equals two-thirds, towards the center and uh, disappears at the center. And the surface then in a sense, it's still a one-sided surface, but it's self-intersecting, and uh, it collapses onto a double cover of the unit disk. Um, so, um, maybe the parametric uh, unit here. Um, local analysis of the ruled surface shows that a twisted fold forms at the boundary um, at this time, t equals two-thirds and propagates towards the center for t, equals, for t greater than two-thirds. And the surface is self-intersecting in a neighborhood of this fold. Well, obviously, a real soap film can't sustain a structure of this kind. I'm sorry, we seem to have lost something up here. I don't know why. Um, here, it has recovered. Um, at a later instant, and actually it's at time t equals four-fifths, the wire has an inflection point, point of zero curvature, 
at um, s equals zero at a particular point. Here is the shape of the wire at that instant t equals four fifths. It's, it's always approaching the circular form, but it actually uh, it's still um, twisted out of the plane, and it has it has torsion in other words, but it has an inflection point here, zero point of zero curvature. That's the same curve looped at from the side, so you see it is sort of twisted out of the plane. The curvature can be very easily computed for knowing the um, uh, parametric representation. We can get the curvature as a function of s and t, so going around the curve as a function of time, and this is what it looks like. And you see there's a, there's a very sharp dip, and that dip corresponds to the inflection point. In fact, if I plot uh, c at the point s equals zero on the curve as a function of time, it uh, it rises a little initially, but then falls to zero, as a zero, and then rises. Now I mentioned this yesterday that when you go through the um, when you go through the stretch twist fold, um, you must go through an inflection point at at some stage in that process, and it's at that inflection point that. Um, you have the transfer from the integral of the torsion to the internal twist um, that uh, I mentioned yesterday. Now here you actually do see it explicitly for the wire. So there's something interesting going on there at uh, these two times, t equals two-thirds and t equals four-fifths. Um, so we go back to this uh, situation here. And um, as I say, the real singularity occurs at, uh, look at it, at the boundary, <laughs> but let's slow it down. Um, let's slow it down, and uh, now here it's going more slowly. 5,600 frames per second, the high-speed camera. So we see the collapse of that bubble to the boundary. Now, there's something funny here, and um, to begin with, we thought this oh, is just an optical effect, because there are, you know, optical effects. You're shining, you're illuminating this film. But then we did this again and again. Uh, you have to imagine this is another experiment. <laughs> we do it again. Oops, um, back one. And uh, is that going to go? Yeah, it starts very slowly and then then speeds up. This is sort of uh, think of it as a D shape, which is collapsing to the boundary and very rapid at the end. Well, always <laughs> we get this um, twist, twisted uh, structure, um, which uh, seemed very curious. And then we looked at it from every angle, and um, it was al always there. And um, so we began to focus on what is going on at the boundary. Uh, this is all explained in this uh, paper in 2010. There have been several papers uh, that we've written since then elaborating on this problem. Well, we've got to look closely at the boundary. Here's the wire, uh, and it has finite, finite diameter. It's not really a mathematical curve. It's uh, it's it's a physical wire, so it has a it has a it has an area of cross section. So the fact that the wire has finite radius is important. Now the plateau border um, is a curve on the surface of that wire, and it's the curve where, if you take the soap film, which is extremely thin, it's down at the molecular level. If you project the soap film, actually the soap film expands near the boundary. If, if this is the wire, the wire boundary, and here's the soap film, in, in reality the soap film does expand. There's an accumulation of fluid here. Um, but if I imagine just continue that curve, it will hit the boundary. And where the soap film produced it's the curve. You get a curve on the surface of the wire, and that's what we know of as the plateau boundary. So it's a curve on the surface of the wire. And you can actually see it. 
here, it's, it lights up because of the slight accumulation of fluid. It lights up here and you can follow it round. And here it comes and it actually disappears behind the wire here. And you come down here and it reappears somewhere here and here it is here. So the plateau boundary is actually twisted round the wire. And the soap film has to twist, responding to that twist in the plateau boundary. And it's the twist of the surface, a rather concentrated twist of the surface, that shows up I as uh, optically through this um, this uh, picture, this rather attractive uh, picture here. Some fluid accumulates here and makes the plateau border visible here, seen just after the jump. Um, so you see what's happened. You started here. We've opened the wire just very slightly and it's jumped to this and the jump takes place through a sequence and you've got a scale D here which goes pretty rapidly in some kind of self-similar manner to zero. Uh, the hole disappears and the topology, the resulting topology, uh, changes. And um, if we take a schematic, the plateau border before the jump um, actually, um, when we, we follow it closely, um, particularly in this neighborhood where the film is going to collapse, the plateau border twists around the wire, but it's a right-handed twist. And after the jump, it's twisted around the wire, as I just showed you, but it's a left-handed twist. So something has changed dramatically, you might say, although on a very small scale, on the scale of the radius of the wire at the moment of collapse. As the wire is gradually distorted, the one-sided film A jumps to a two-sided film here, and these are frames from a high-speed movie at intervals of 5.4 microseconds, showing the uh, collapse process. After the collapse, the plateau border is twisted around the frame in the opposite sense, as shown here. And the caustic in I, yeah, this is the caustic, is a consequence of the locally concentrated twist of the surface. Um, so here's the plateau border after the collapse, as I say, so it comes this way. It's a left-handed twist round the, round the axis of the wire. Um, <coughs> twist around the wire can be seen. The resulting residual twist at the surface shows up through the amplified optical effect. This pattern persists after the transition. You can ask, yes, what happens if we go on unfolding back to the circle after the transition? The pattern persists after the transition for so long as the wire is held in this fixed position, but it gradually disappears if the unfolding and untwisting of the wire is continued. And the reason for that, I mean, you can follow it for a certain time, but the concentrated twist tends to spread out along the wire as you continue the fold, continue the unfolding. Well, I just uh, give you that picture just uh, uh, say it's suggestive, this is the uh, solar situation, solar corona, and often this sort of twisted eruption is seen as a result of the movement of the foot points. It's appealing, this fact that uh, this sort of picture can be uh, reproduced in a tabletop experiment with soap film is intriguing. No more than that. Yes, yes. Yes, the scale of the of the uh, of what's going on on the plateau boundary. It's uh, of the order of it's a fraction of a millimeter. And in the sun, of course, <laughs> you're up at the you're, you're thousands of kilometers. Yes. Yeah. Oh yes, yes. That's why this sort of uh, analogy is, is is in a way a, bit, a little bit far fetched. <laughs> Yes, of the wire. Um, oh, there's a there's a factor of of at least a thousand difference. Yes, at least. You see, yeah, the <coughs> thickness of the soap, soap, soap film, as I say, is you're down to almost one one uh, one molecule. 
It's really, really a very, very thin film. It's amazing that the soap films do survive for so long, that they're so strong. <laughs> yeah, well <laughs> yes, yes, uh, in, uh, oh, uh, uh, there are, yes, yes. <laughs> there are, um, that's right, there are uh, uh, numerous different, very different length scales involved in, the, in these problems. But um, then what, what's happening, actually this is before the, before the jump. The plateau border is indicated in red here, and there's an over, under, over, under. So it's actually doubly linked. The plateau border is doubly linked. You can play this sort of thing again with, as uh, Lou Kaufman was mentioning last night, with uh, Mobius strip. And you cut the Mobius strip, not along the middle, but at one-third distance one-third distance and pretend that that is the plateau border and cut along one-third all the way and you go on and on and on <laughs> right or twice round um, and you find that that plateau border is doubly linked with the with the center line of the mobile strip so you've got over under over under but at the moment of uh, collapse that under over changes to an over under so what was over, under, over, under becomes over, over, under, under. And when you have an over, over, that's, um, that can be pulled off, and an under, under can be pulled off. So it's not linked at all. So after the jump, the plateau border is not linked with the, with the boundary. And that is a feature of a two-sided disk. So you're into the, you've jumped from the topology characteristic of a Mobius film to the to topology of a, a disk uh, spanning, spanning the uh, wire. I tried to indicate more closely what's going on. It's, it's not difficult, it's difficult to understand just precisely what is going on with the surface in the neighborhood of the jump. But I think it looks something like this um, before the jump where you have an over-under twist and after when it's an under over uh, and you see there's something funny has happened as you go from there to there. At the critical moment of change the plateau boundary is uh, actually a straight line along the cylinder at the critical moment, straight line along the cylinder and a circle. And it's that straight line and circle uh, that then opens out. It's closed one way and it opens out the other way. And what's going on is actually a viscous effect on the wire. And to resolve that requires an analysis in, uh, in, of the viscous diffusive effect in the immediate vicinity of the wire. Um, there is a scaling regime, as I say, that uh, s length d characteristic scale of the bubble goes to zero and there are two regimes where it's going to zero. It's going to zero in this direction, critical time T P, of a time of collapse. And um, there seem to be two straight lines. This is a log log uh, plot, um, a range where it's going like a one third power, and in the final stage you're going like a, a two. There's two here, so it's two two thirds power, which is controlled by um, inertia again. Um, <coughs> it's the inertia of the film. You see, it's accelerating so rapidly at this stage that inertia becomes important at the final stage. And it's that inertia that, um, I mean, on dimensional grounds, if you just have time, surface tension, and uh, density representing the inertia effect, then uh, you're led inevitably to two-thirds. On the other hand, if it's viscous control, then... Um, um, with the scale of the wire, the diameter of the wire comes in, H. Viscous, viscosity, and uh, you get a, a one-third power law. So we think it's viscous here, and then inertia at the very final, final instant. And you're approaching a finite time singularity. And that's just what it is. Well, we have an improved theory um, of this, uh, just mentioned briefly. Um, I, I say the theory I gave you before just it wasn't really a theory. It involved ruled surface, which is not a minimal surface. But there is a minimal surface, and it's due to Meeks. It was in um, 
I think about 1988, the Meeks Mobius minimal surface has this parametric form. Um, alpha sine theta minus beta sine two theta minus gamma sine three theta. And similar terms for the this x component, y component, z component. Two, uh, two uh, alpha is r minus one over r, beta is r squared plus one over r squared, gamma as r cubed and minus one over r cubed. So that's the parametric representation. Of, and as you vary the r zero, r varies between an r zero and one over r zero. As r zero is varied, you get you run through a family of surfaces, and uh, you start here. Um, r zero is small, and this uh, let's see, r zero is small. This is simply the same picture seen from different perspectives, um, and as r no r zero is equal to one in the limit, uh, so it's r zero decreasing. As r zero decreases, uh, this surface. Uh, the whole decreases, um, and uh, it's uh, it looks pretty well like our our um, Mobius minimal surface at this sort of stage. If you go too far, there's a, another little dip appears, and that's the result of the cos three theta sine three theta terms that appear here. But we can't remove them. That is the Meeks minimal surface. There's no way of getting away from it. However, we can take that surface and analyze its stability. Um, and there are ways of doing that. And it turns out that it's stable to the, uh, when uh, R is less than R0, uh, greater than a critical value that again has vanished. I'm sorry to say, I can probably recover it. <coughs> I think it's, um, yeah. Zero point five four five is the uh, critical value, um, and uh, that comes out of um, uh, uh, a decent um, analysis of the stability problem, um, which we published in in this paper. Um, so um, we believe, and this actually corresponds pretty well with um, what we observe for the soap film. It's not going to be exact because by this stage, as I say, the the extra little dip has appeared and it becomes more more and more prominent. And it may be the appearance of that dip that has something to do with the the uh, actual instability of this surface. Um, I don't know that I'll try to explain this, or will I? The critical value for stability is found from the condition that the second variation of the area functional should vanish. This reduces to finding the solution psi of a Jacobi equation. It's Laplacian minus 2kw psi equals, it's an eigenvalue problem, lambda w psi. W is the metric, k the Gaussian curvature. These functions are known explicitly for the um, Meeks minimal surface. And the condition lambda equals zero for critical in, uh, stability uh, then determines the value here, Rc, and, and also the shape of the surface uh, or the shape of the mode of instability at that stage. And the mode of instability, this, I'm afraid the battery is just about to run out, just at the right time. Um, where it's dark red here, that is where the mode of instability is maximal, where the collapse is actually observed to occur. So um, this ties in quite well with um, with the observation, the uh, the the fact that um, this hole of the Mobius strip does collapse to the point opposite on the boundary. The curve C is what's known as the systole, like a curve in C. That curve, you see, you can just see it there, drawn on the surface. The systole, it's the curve of shortest length that actually goes around the hole. And that's very close to the location of the maximum of the uh, eigenfunction, the unstable eigenfunction where the collapse is located. Uh, <coughs> so, um, there are other things uh, that we can play with with the um, 
with the soap film, and this is with the disc included, the interior disc. One can make these things quite uh, easily. Uh, in fact, it's usually hard to eliminate the disc. So um, there you pull pull apart, um, and uh, the disc is contracting, and so fluid is accumulating. Oops, I'm sorry. I fluid accumulates. Let me go back and do that one again. So we're pulling them apart. So the disc interior is contracting and fluid accumulates around the uh, the join where the 120 degree angles are. And um, and you see that instability. It's uh, what's called a fingering instability in fluid mechanics. And it's gravitational. The accumulated fluid forms fingers that run down uh, on the surface of the soap film. And uh, it's quite an intriguing phenomenon. I don't think it had been observed before. That may be at a more advanced stage. I, I don't know if um, we can pull pull them apart and the fingers get quite, uh, well, that goes all the way. And you see again, <laughs> the breakup of a, of a thread, the singular thread on the center line and the formation of uh, drops and satellite drops and all the rest. Um, so uh, there are various uh, pictures that illustrate this phenomenon, but now we're really into the regime of uh, interesting fluid mechanics um, rather than not theory, so I won't, um, I won't. Um, well, I started off with the analogy between the soap film dynamics and the magnetic uh, problem. And by the analogy to each magnetostatic equilibrium, no matter how complex there exists. Um, oh, I don't know, I don't want to go through this one. It's, uh, it's uh, I'm sorry, it shouldn't, it's a bit, little bit misplaced. But I do want to show you this uh, picture. Um, and it's from an old book, which was published exactly 100 years ago, 1917. Famous book by Darcy Wentworth Thompson on growth and form. And uh, it includes this picture and many other beautiful drawings, and which he, he writes the most remarkable protozoan configuration, that of the ciliate infusoria. Here the curved contour curved contour here, seems to enter, re-enter, and disappear within the substance of the body, so bounding a deep and twisted space or passage, which merges with the fluid contents and vanishes within the cell. Well, uh, you think of this as a, an example of topological ingenuity in molecular biology. A very intriguing picture. And sort of related to the stretch twist fold that we've just been considering. Well, I mention this because there will be a program on growth, form, and self-organization at the Newton Institute in Cambridge from August to December this year, marking the centenary of this famous uh, book, his pioneering book on uh, growth and forms. So I draw it to your attention. Within that program, there are four one-week workshops distributed throughout this period. Uh, one of them, uh, a satellite workshop held up in Dundee in Scotland, which was where Darcy Thompson became a professor at the age of 24, <laughs> two years after graduating in Cambridge. <laughs> That's the way it was in those days. He was only beaten by Kelvin. You know how old Kelvin was when he became a professor at the University of Glasgow. He was 22. <laughs> and likewise, he had just graduated. He wasn't even senior wrangler, Kelvin. The story about Kelvin is he was actually second wrangler. He was second. He had his, um, we called it his, his jip, his servant in the college. And he sent him down. He said, go down, look at the res exam results on the Senate House notice board and f come back and tell me who's second. <laughs> <laughs> and his jip came back and he said, you are, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, tomorrow I'll 
finish, I'll try to tie up some loose ends. I've left a lot of, of loose ends in these oh, three lectures, so I'll try and bring it all together tomorrow. Thank you very much.